Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, I am pleased to call to order public meeting number 118 of the Mass Gaming Commission being held again at the Boston's Convention Center um, at about a little couple, couple minutes after 9.30. 10.30. Sorry, after 10.30. Thank you. Um, the first two items on the agenda are to discuss the premises of the gaming establishment for which the two Region A applicants uh, seek approval. Um, but there have been some developments uh, in a, shortly, recently, that I need to bring up. Um, late yesterday, uh, yesterday afternoon about, I think, 4 o'clock, we received a letter from uh, the city uh, requesting a one-week uh, extension in the uh, negotiation, uh, in the uh, time between uh, now and the time we would hold this meeting. In other words, a one-week extension on the week on the uh, negotiating process that we are in now. Uh, the, the letter I want to read to you um, says, Dear Chairman Crosby and Massachusetts Gaming Commissioners, the City of Boston, the City requests the Mass Gaming Commission postpone its public meeting scheduled to be held May 1st, 2014 at 10.30 a.m. to determine the premises of the gaming establishment for which Mohegan Sun, Massachusetts LLC seeks approval in its RFA 2 application and determine the premises of the gaming establishment for which Win Mass LLC seeks approval in its RFA 2 application. The city respectfully requests this postponement of no less than seven days in order to determine what action, if any, the city is required to take in accordance with the gaming applicants and applicable law and other relevant provisions in general law, chapter 23, the Gaming Act, and the city makes this request so that the city has an adequate opportunity to review new information which may be forthcoming from the applicants and evaluate such information accordingly. The city would appreciate receiving your concurrence to its request for a postponement today, that was yesterday and was obviously not possible. Thank you for your immediate attention to this important matter of public interest. Very truly yours, Elizabeth Delarusso, Senior Assistant Corporation Counsel. Uh, that letter was followed uh, an hour or two later by a call from the governor to me um, requesting that um, we do give due consideration to the city's request and encouraging us to um, grant the one week request. Um, and I just want to find my notes. Um, he felt strongly that it is in everybody's interest to have this resolved uh, in a negotiated um, and amicable way. Uh, and, uh, and I want to characterize his point of view as carefully as possible, so this is close to a direct quote. Um, he had talked to Mayor Walsh, and he believes, uh, he the governor believes, that the parties are close enough that it is worth giving the process another week. Um, I said that we would take it under advisement. Obviously, I'm only one member of the commission. I did tell the commissioners last night about the governor's call in order that they would have time to think about it. We have not uh, deliberated on it for reasons which you all know. Um, we also have the fact that we have uh, a number of parties who uh, have submitted briefs and who are here today to testify. Um, and we need to think about what is equitable for them as we also think about what we do on this request. So um, before we get into the original anticipated uh, topics, um, I throw it open for discussion on principally the question of whether we should grant the week um, and secondarily how we handle appropriately the folks who are here in the expectation of participating in the process. Uh, I, I'd like to mention, um, I'd like to mention something. Uh, th this is not the first uh, letter or the first uh, comment like this that we, that we get from, from the city. Um, but it is certainly the first time that we hear from the governor, obviously. I would so, just emphasize that. This <laughs> is the first time I have ever heard from the governor. Um, 
so this, this probably really makes it um, a unique and worthy of consideration uh, 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 situation. Um, but, but if I read, and I've read, I've read and reread the letter from the city, there's, um, there's not a lot in there that would lead us to believe that there's something significantly new. Uh, and I would just like to get your thoughts, Mr. Chairman, as to whether some of that is uh, maybe, in fact, the case. Um, as to? Well, they do say that uh, they need time to review new information, um, which, to their credit, they've been asking for a long time, and that's, it's great. That there, there appears to be, um, if there's new information that's, in their, in their view, then that's fantastic. Uh, but would, would, would a week satisfy um, these, these new information is, my, is fundamentally my question. The review of that new information. You know, I don't have any, you know, I don't know anything more than you do. Um, uh, you know, my, my I, think the, the, I think the governor's perception, having spoken to the mayor, which none of us have, the governor's perception was, two things. One is he believes strongly, and I think we all agree with this, that this process is meant to be a negotiated process between and among the various parties. Whether it's host or surrounding, either one is a negotiated process. Arbitration and court actions are undesirable uh, to the extent that they can be avoided. I think he, I think that was part of what motivated him. And as he, as I read, he, uh, I believe, believes that the parties are close enough that uh, it warrants another week of conversation, or a week of time, I should say. I don't, um, but that's really all I, I have to conclude. The city, um, the, the request was for not less than a week. I assume they didn't pick that number without reason. Um, so uh, I can only conclude that the city has some confidence that that week would do the job. Whatever job it is, they don't articulate what they think the outcome is of that week, but. Mm. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I have, um, you in particular have said all along that um, uh, a, a, neg a negotiated agreement between the parties is absolutely the best way to go. I've always agreed with you in that, those statements. And I think this may be an example, it is a respectful letter from, um, from the city asking for our consideration in this matter. Um, and it is not a long extension, and the information that folks are talking to one another and negotiating with one another certainly is a good thing, part of our process. So I, um, you know, this isn't something we haven't done before in, in circumstances, so I, I'd, I'd be in favor of uh, uh, giving them a week uh, in consideration of uh, conversations that are going on and, and, and realizing that the best decisions are made by the parties involved. I, uh, go ahead. I, would, I would echo Commissioner Cameron's thought. I mean, you know, we, at some point, we understand that these relationships need to have a life beyond just the initial licensing process. Uh, Surrounding community agreements, host community agreements are, are an arrangement for more than just five or six months or an arrangement for anywhere from five to 15 years. We want to, if, this might be an opportunity to kind of further those good relationships between a community and, and our two applicants so that uh, in the future that, uh, you know, they'll have a, they'll maintain this opportunity to have a good working relationship together. But uh, I think, Mr. Chairman, your second question, if I heard you correctly, you know, we certainly have a number of the parties here that wanted to be heard on this issue and certainly would entertain, you know, invite them to stay and continue to offer testimony regardless of whether we decide to grant this extension or not. But I would be in favor of it. I, I uh, uh, think this, um, the, uh, the, there is a deadline, today's a deadline. We've, we've set deadlines in the past. Deadlines are important. They're important because they're deadlines and they're important because they're prods to action. As a deadline approaches, uh, people uh, tend to think more concretely about uh, the matters that are in dispute and often reach uh, some kind of a solution. 
but deadlines aren't absolutes. We had uh, the initial deadlines uh, for a variety of things uh, set up so that we could get the license fees into the state coffers uh, before the end of this fiscal year and thus accommodate the budget planning that had gone on last uh, fall. Uh, for a variety of reasons, that's proven to be impossible, and so we no longer have that functional deadline uh, ahead of us. Um, and it seems to me that uh, a deadline uh, that we set for making a decision today is, um, is a useful tool but not, uh, uh, does not have a life in and of itself. The request uh, for an extension is short. It's a one-week uh, request for an extension. Uh, the request was made uh, by the city, uh, and it was made uh, by the governor. We've got a request uh, by the highest elected official in the Commonwealth and the highest elected official in the Commonwealth's major city, and it's backed by an assertion that progress has been made toward uh, a, a, an amicable resolution of the issues that now divide the city uh, and the applicants, and I think we have to, for the reasons that uh, Commissioner Steven said, allow that uh, 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 ongoing uh, uh, process uh, to improve. We can also, uh, it seems to me, uh, Mr. Chairman and colleagues, use uh, the one-week time to perhaps uh, work with uh, uh, the applicant, particularly Suffolk Downs, with respect to the terms of uh, the lease uh, that uh, people have inquired about, uh, see if the uh, uh, entire uh, 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 lease uh, needs to be uh, maintained as a trade secret, or whether there are portions of it that can be released so that the people can see uh, 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 some of the primary terms of that lease and clear up some of the mystery that surrounds that. So we can use it for that uh, purpose as well. Uh, and it seems to me that granting the continuance really does nobody any harm, with the possible exception of the No Easty Casino folks who are volunteers who have other things, who are prepared uh, and have been prepared to come here today and present their testimony. But I think that uh, with respect to them and with respect to the others uh, who uh, are here today to offer testimony, uh, we could offer them the opportunity to do that today. Uh, the city is not here, but the city will have an opportunity to read uh, a transcript and look at the video of what was said today. They can come back next week as well. Uh, so I think we can uh, accommodate them as, as best we can, uh, given the fact that we didn't get this request uh, until uh, close to 5 o'clock last night. So for all of those reasons, I'd be in favor of uh, allowing the uh, uh, request for a, a one-week uh, continuance, as it were, and using the time profitably for ourselves and hearing from those who wish to speak today as well. Go ahead, if you will. Well, yeah, no, it looks, looks like we might have a majority already. Um, but um, I, really, I really hope that, uh, and I'm going to say this probably just for the record, um, but obviously for our audience, um, I, I, I really hope that the city recognizes that this commission, the staff, um, and many of, of the other parties here have been, uh, have been acting in nothing but good faith. Um, and and this, is, this is really... Um, as, as we, if we, if we grant this uh, extension, is yet another example of, of that. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not suggesting that the city has acted in, 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 in anything close to bad faith, but I would really, it would really help everybody if we don't get letters five o'clock or four o'clock the day before our, our meeting. Um, we are uh, constrained uh, for very good reasons, um, notably the, the open public meeting and the public purpose, uh, to put items on our agenda two, week, uh, two days in advance. And, uh, and there's nothing that can prevent anybody from, uh, from doing at least um, you know, a little bit of planning around, around that. Um, this is partly my point about um, you know, this not being the first time either. Uh, so I, I, I really uh, would hope that, that that is at least recognized, and, um, uh, but, but I would, of course, um, join the majority and, um, and, and grant the extension. Yeah, I, I, think, the, uh, I think your point about the, um, we've, re we've been referring to the, uh, the document between uh, uh, Mohegan Sun and Suffolk Downs, or Sterling Suffolk LLC, I think it is, as the lease. And as I understand it, it's not 
the, it's not a lease, it's a lot of things. It does, it, it stands as a, a document which for the time being serves multiple purposes, but it anticipates that there will be a separate lease at some time and a completed lease, and this is not a completed lease. Um, we have been considering all of the documents pertaining to the land transactions as similar and as fundamentally confidential documents. And I think for the most part that is a reasonable um, agreement. But this is a differentiable document from the option agreements, for example, that Wynn and MGM have on their properties. And with giving everybody sufficient notice, we don't want to just, you know, do this differently without giving people a heads up. And there are certainly, I'm sure, things in that, in that agreement um, which uh, deserve to be protected and, and appropriately redacted. Um, but I think that this week will be constructively used if we get those redactions done ASAP, agree on what the appropriate redactions are, and get the document out there. So that's an important, that's an important benefit, I think, of the time. Second point, just sort of my own spin on what others have said. You know, we have considered one of our primary jobs throughout this process going way back to when Springfield start, decided to set up its own vetting process. We have considered um, it one of our jobs to try to facilitate the relationships between uh, the communities and the applicants. Our, one of our very first hires was an ombudsman whose practically full-time job has been to work those relationships. And we have been exceedingly deferential to the uh, local control uh, and local oversight role that is in the legislation and as anticipated. And I think this is, a, this is consistent with that action, particularly since I think nobody's ox gets gored seriously with the extension. And then the third point, and this is non-trivial, obviously, um, for the record, uh, I have never spoken to the governor ever since the press release uh, when I was announced, press event when I was announced uh, nearly two years ago, or I guess two years ago. Um, he's never contacted me about this at all uh, or anything else. The fact that he would um, consider it important enough suggests to me that his conviction about the value of an amicable solution and negotiated party-based solution and the likelihood of that occurring is great enough um, that he would take a fairly unusual step. So that's meaningful to me. So taken all together, you know, I, I, would, I would recommend that we grant the, um, how we frame it, the, what did you call it? A, an, an ex I called it a continuance, but that's a, a, a holdover from a, from a different life. Um, and uh, an extension, we could call it. Okay, so um, extension. Um, do, um, do we further discuss Commissioner Stebbins' point about um, whether we allow um, or um, permit, um, permit uh, if, if speakers, uh, parties, anybody who submitted briefs, uh, this perhaps have, would I, be optional I, at this point? I, I, don't, I, I don't know. Yeah, I would completely agree, and I don't think there's any disagreement. I think, you know, folks have come here prepared to speak. Um, and anybody that wants them, we, we will, if this all gets resolved in the next week and there's no need for us to have this, have this meeting, then all to the good. Um, if it doesn't get resolved in the next week, then we will reconvene. Um, and if the folks who are here want to, want to give their testimony now and wouldn't preclude them from re-testifying if new issues were raised between now and the end of the week. So yes, I would agree with Commissioner Stebbins on that. Does anybody disagree with that? No. Yeah. So, can, can I just put one one point on on, uh, on, uh, on, a, on a, one of my uh, one of my uh, pieces of my thinking uh, about granting this, and that is that the governor's uh, call uh, is important to me in, in thinking about that, and his statement of belief that that uh, uh, the parties would benefit from this because they're they're close. Uh, but it's also important uh, that that was a telephone call about a matter of process and not a matter of substance. And uh, it seems to me uh, that the governor, uh, the governor's putting his uh, uh, weight behind a process designed to lead to an amicable, amicable agreement is an important uh, point to take into account. I, 
insofar as a matter of substance was concerned, I think we wouldn't have had that conversation. I don't think he would have called. And if he'd called, I'm, I'm sure uh, uh, that none of us uh, would have answered that call. Uh, so, Yeah, let uh, me just reinforce that, because the, the, there was no discussion about whether Boston was a host community or a surrounding community. There was no discussion about any of the substantive issues that we have to deal with. It was only uh, his um, weighing in that he thought that the extension was a good idea. That was the only topic of discussion. That's an important point to make. Do you want to um, frame it? <laughs> Commissioner McHugh, make the motion. I move, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, that um, the commission grant the um, uh, City of Boston's request for an extension of the deadline um, for uh, uh, making the um, uh, uh, determination as to the location of the gaming establishment uh, proposed by the Wynn and Mohegan Sun applicants and continue and uh, post uh, extend the date for making that uh, decision uh, until a Thursday a week from today. Second. I second. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Okay. Um, the, the, the next or what was to be the first item on the agenda was um, testimony relative to the gaming establishment for which Mohegan Sun LLC seeks approval. Um, I'm, I have um, some prepared remarks for the process. I think I won't bother going through those because we, we are not going to do today what we thought we were going to do and when we prepared that. So I think I will leave it a little more informal and simply invite, first of all, anybody who submitted either a brief or a reply brief uh, who is interested in testifying on that issue today on Mohegan Sun, please to come forward starting with the applicant. Recognizing, I take it as implicit in that, that if they prefer to defer it to next week or prefer to do some now and do it next week, that that's their right. Correct. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I'm Kevin Conroy from the law firm of Foley Hoag. I represent Mohegan Sun. We're going to defer um, um, uh, nearly all of our testimony today. I did just want to quickly mention uh, the issue of the binding lease uh, agreement that we have with Sterling Suffolk. That is a binding document. Um, it, it, is, uh, it is the equivalent of a lease. Um, and we're, we're very happy to work with the commission this week on, uh, on, on figuring out which portions of that document should be released. We will say, though, it's a binding document, similar to the document that Wynn has to purchase its property in, uh, in, in uh, Everett, uh, in a portion of Boston. And we would encourage that the commission consider requiring both parties to release portions of their, uh, of their binding agreements. OK. Thank you. I, I, I Thank you. appreciate that point. Uh, so Mohegan, um, I think uh, Noisti was the other party that had submitted um, a brief or and or reply brief. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So just for the record, Celeste Myers, No Easty Casino. I'll start us off and then, and then hand it over to Matt Cameron. Um, just to register again for the record, naturally I'm incredulous that we're, we're here. The language in the law seemed pretty clear. The roadmap seemed pretty clear. Despite all odds, we were successful in our mission to pull out a no vote in East Boston. So naturally, surprised that we're here. Um, you know, <clears throat> sorry about that. Um, one thing that I cannot state enough um, and I think everybody knows this, that what we're experiencing right now is a lot of fancy legal uh, machinations trying to extract Suffolk Downs um, from East Boston and extract East Boston and the city of Boston from impacts of a Suffolk Downs casino. There's simply no way to do that. And in parallel, while we're on the subject, no way to extract Charlestown from the impacts of an Everett casino. Now, um, what we've also learned through this experience is that the developers will do an awful lot to 
have things come around their way. In Everett, we've seen some really creative reimaginations of the law, and, and, um, and I'm sorry, Revere, a lot of creative reimaginations of the law, and in Everett, some real creative land deals. Um, and at the end of the day, it still remains that what we've seen, the only folks remaining consistent and the only folks towing the line are the residents, the folks that have followed the law. We've met every benchmark, every high point, every requirement of us. We've you know, conducted ourselves um, to the standards that you all have set and still have not yielded the results. I guess the key message I'd like to share with Mayor Walsh as he takes the next week to prepare and to negotiate with Mohegan Sun is that what we've learned through our experience is that there's no reason to expect more or to expect that the developers, the negotiators, the landowners with um, all of their, their backroom deals, um, including the secret lease that you've conceded, Commissioner uh, Chairman Crosby, that is much more than just a lease, that really is kind of the crux of their negotiation, the crux of their continued investment in, in this process. And what we've learned is that the reason why folks at every level have been so easy, so um, quick to dismiss the resounding vote of no in East Boston, proxy for the city of Boston, as you know, enabled by the city council, is because people don't feel like they're in any imminent legal, political, or financial danger from our little ragtag group, our little scrappy group, as we've been called. Um, and you know, this is a caution to Mayor Walsh in the city of Boston in any host community or surrounding community that's entering to an agreement with any of these entities that unless you're prepared to litigate from now into perpetuity, there is no way, no way to guarantee that any of these agreements will be upheld. And just as a point of clarification, as we're hoping that um, Mayor Walsh is continuing to march to, um, to secure a host community status for the city of Boston, for a Revere development and ideally an Everett development as well. I just have one question because we've been the victim of a lot of perceived ambiguity in the law. Should we be fortunate enough to have the city of Boston granted a host community? Is it true that um, as a means or a mechanism to divest ourselves from the conversation, that is to say, if we want to tell the developers no, no thank you, we're not interested, we've already spoken. Must it go to a vote? Must a vote be conducted in order to divest of the negotiation process? If Boston is a host community, is that what yes. you're asking? Yes, if Boston, If it were determined that Boston were a host community, would it require a vote? Is that what you're asking? Right. I think we know the answer to that. I think the answer is yes. That's it a, must go to a vote? How is Boston different than Holyoke? That's where I, I get stuck. The 23-year-old mayor of Holyoke refused to negotiate with developers, and the conversation was over. Well, Why? What would be different in Boston? Well, I, I think we're getting into hypotheticals now. Well, but it's not hypothetical because we. It is a hypothetical, Ms. Myers. We don't have an issue in front of us, and I'm, as one commissioner, very reluctant to get into speculation about a complex piece of uh, legislation and its application to a discrete set of facts without knowing what the facts are. And, and I understand your, your eagerness for an answer, but you have able counsel here. And sure. uh, I don't think uh, the commission, uh, I as one commissioner am not, am not prepared to uh, make a definitive judgment on those kinds of questions sure. today. Here, here's, here's, my, here's where I'm coming from with this question. Now, um, with, with all due respect, we had every reason to believe by the language on both the East Boston and Revere ballots and the language in the legislation that a no vote in any community would at the very least have put this on the back burner for six months. We would have just been beginning conversations about any continued development at Suffolk Downs. Now, my concern is that folks have already seen this process fail. We said no. Their plans are to go ahead 100 miles an hour. And my concern is that should we get granted host community status and it goes to a vote, folks are going to feel coerced into changing their vote, even though they don't want a, a, a casino in their community. That's my concern. And if this is not the appropriate venue, with the press and the cameras and the documentation because we've been chastised before for not having appropriate documentation to, to back up our interpretation of the law, then I don't know what the appropriate venue is and I look to you for guidance for that. 
Well, the, this may be the appropriate venue. It's not, in my view, the appropriate time. That's that's the problem because we don't have uh, concretely in front of us a set of facts that we can do. Okay. And respectfully, I submit that once decision is made on host community status, then that time is too late. Then that time is too late. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to hand it over to Matt Cameron now. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Martin. Let, let me just see. I'm, um, I I don't think we can can or should comment on a on a particular hypothetical. Um, but I do think that the law is pretty clear that if an applicant and a bidder, an applicant and a municipality agree uh, at the governing body of an applicant and a municipality, governing body of a municipality and an applicant agree that a, the municipality is a host community, that the process from there forward is pretty well outlined. And I don't think we think that the process is any different. Um, See, I, but I think Ms. Meyer's point, and this is why I really don't want to get into this conversation, I think Ms. Meyer's point is that there already has been a vote. So if there's a new uh, a designation of Boston as a host community agreement, does the old vote count? I think that's your point. And I, I don't know the answer to that question. Well, and I don't want to decide that question sure. today. I mean, the, the mayor may decide, and I don't purport to know what is in his head, but the mayor may decide that he wants to uphold the, the law. I mean, the um, the the vote of his constituents, you know, um, and so it, his goal to assert host community status may be just to really um, confirm that we that this can't proceed without the input and without um, the cooperation of the city of Boston. And he may decide that he wants to um, side with his constituents. I, I understood okay. that to be the, the thrust of your question. And, and, okay. and Thank you. you just can't I, for one, Commissioner, can't decide that today. Uh, very briefly, I'm going to keep this as brief as I can, given the circumstances this morning. Uh, I would say that we'd certainly reserve the right to come back, and depending on how things go over the next week, uh, this was a surprise to us, and there's an elephant in the room here that will be with us next week, so I think that we probably should wait on some of these issues. Um, but I, I will reiterate, as, in, as reiterated in our brief, that we endorse everything that the City of Boston said in, as of April 17th. And no matter what the city of Boston says in the future, that's where we stand. Uh, but I do want to discuss one issue that will not be changing, no matter what the city says or does within the next week, and that is the fact that the track at Suffolk Downs remain, remains an amenity for any casino built at that site. Um, you know, this is an issue that we've been turning over for a while. I know that the commission has as well. Uh, I know that everyone around this issue has been thinking about this, and what I'm about to say is not new. But I just want to reiterate very, very strongly that you have a casino development project that has been completely built around and marketed as a supplement to a racetrack. And I think that it's, I'm just gonna say it, disingenuous for the applicants to come before you in these briefs and say that this is somehow just a piece of property that is appended to this project as if it's just an empty lot because they, this is a racetrack with a lot of history. It's a very important piece of land. Uh, it's something that means a lot to us in East Boston. And I, I just cannot possibly see how this is not being marketed and how this will not be an amenity to any casino on that land. And that, is, that, that was a big part of the, the sell when they were marketing both of these projects in both of the elections that we have previously had on this. And it will continue to be. And without comment, I just want to make again clear that that is, in any definition of the word amenity, that racetrack is an amenity. Under the law, under common sense, under definitions that we use in everyday parlance, under the real estate de de definition of the term. That's something that is a draw, and it is something that will continue to operate co-equally with the casino project. And it was that way when Caesars was in charge as well. <coughs> when Caesars was just going to be the operator, they were going to have full operational control of their half of it, and Suffolk Downs was going to continue operational control of their half of things. And uh, we had architect before this commission on January 22nd coming before and saying, uh, with some very nice pictures, that this track is built into the casino so that patrons will be able to watch it, so they'll be able to enjoy the horses while they're playing the slots, uh, that the track is actually literally, he used the word receiving the casino, or the casino is receiving the track, excuse me, the other way around. He talked about the design of the oval and the crescent and history and architecture. Uh, you know, there was some really nice presentation on that, and I think that that was something that they wanted to get across to the commission. It's something I want to reinforce today. Um, there is just no way around this basic fact. And I, I understand there's always two sides to an argument here, but this is a casino at Suffolk Downs. This is what we voted against, and this will continue to be what we voted against, and I just don't see how we get around that. Uh, the other arguments as to the 
intangibility uh, of the other amenities in the city of Boston. Uh, I do reserve the right to continue to argue those. I will just mention very briefly, just so that it's out there, that this is a Boston casino. Both of these are Boston casinos, and we certainly are equally opposed to both of them. One of them happens to be three miles from my house. But these are Boston casinos being marketed as Boston projects. Uh, Wynn has been especially enthusiastic about embracing the city of Boston, and we certainly appreciate that, but it's without our consent. Uh, and this is something that I, I just, I understand, as argued in the, in the applicant's briefs, that the city of Boston does not own M Massport, does not own the highways, does not own the airport. But host community status isn't about necessarily the structures, isn't about the buildings, it isn't about all of that other stuff. It's about the people who live there and how they are going to be affected. Um, and that's when, I, when you look down the commission's regulations as to defining what a surrounding community is, that is the focus, is on the, this, the impact on the people. Uh, there's a mention as to commute back and forth to the site, which in this case is uh, literally stepping over a line. Um, this is far more than a surrounding community. We are essentially going to be hosting a casino, whether or not we want to. And I, I just would really appreciate, and I know that we all would, if the commission would recognize that. Because we've been hearing a lot of talk about how this is a Revere-only project, or it's an Everett-only project. Um, and geographically, within the exact inches of this project, setting aside the track, even as an argument, maybe that's true. We don't even know. Maybe that's true. But what matters here is how this thing is, is being sold to the public and being marketed. And that is as a Boston community project. And I, I just think that it would be absolutely egregious for this to go forward in the absence of consent or cooperation from the city of Boston, in the face of a vote in which we've already said that we don't want it, in the face of polling in Charlestown, which suggests at this point 35% support for Casino and Everett. I think that that would be absolutely, uh, well, I'm going to say unfortunate. But uh, that's our position. Again, we do reserve the right to come back. I don't want to use all my time here. But that is uh, how we've briefed it, and that's where we stand. And again, we do endorse what the city had to say as of April 17th. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, also, the city of Revere um, had uh, weighed in in writing Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Morning. Chairman. Brian Falk from the law firm Myrick O'Connell, special counsel of the city of Revere. City of Revere would like to defer its testimony to next week. Okay. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next item on the, that's it, right, for the win. Yes. I'm uh, sorry, for the um, Mohegan Sun. Um, the next item was to determine the premises of the gaming establishment for which win Mass LLC seeks approval in its RFA2 application. And there was a brief submitted by Wynn. Uh, if you would like to come forward. Can I? Um, yes. While Mr. Starr gets, uh, gets settled, I just want to make a, a disclosure that uh, Mr. Starr in the, in the past uh, provided advice to the school building authority where I was uh, a director. The advice came to the executive director and, um, and the board, uh, but I'm familiar with his work um, personally. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Zuniga. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Tony Starr from the Mintz Levin Law Firm on behalf of WinMass LLC. Uh, we will defer our presentation that had been intended for this morning uh, till next uh, Thursday, May 8th. Um, WinMass objects to this postponement or continuance. It has come as a complete surprise to Win. We had no notice of this until we arrived at 10.30 this morning and you disclosed <coughs> Uh, the fact that you had received a letter at 4 o'clock yesterday afternoon. We did not receive a copy of that letter, and I can tell you from Wynn's perspective, we have had no such conversations with the city, nor is there any pending new information related to the issue of determining the premises of the gaming establishment for which Wynn Mass LLC seeks approval in its RFA2 application. I would Excuse like me. to. According to this letter, Steve Taco from M ML Strategies was copied. Didn't. Well, that, it, yeah. we, we, we believed that you had yeah. notice. Okay. I appreciate that. Um, I am the counsel of record for WinMass LLC in connection with this proceeding, and I would ask that if anybody is providing correspondence or communication in writing regarding this proceeding where I have an appearance on record, I would ask that I receive it in a timely manner. 
and I did not receive it. I am the counsel of record. I have the appearance for win on this. Uh, my final uh, request for clarification, Mr. Chairman, from the Commission is that the only aspect that is being continued is the event of the hearing itself. The rest of the rules and procedures that you carefully laid out three weeks ago, which Wynn has complied with, <coughs> will be adhered to. And by that I mean there is no change in how the agenda was set up for today. Um, there will be no new written submissions by entities who did not follow the filing requirements of April 17th and April 24th. And finally, you also made clear that only those entities who filed on either April 17th or April 24th would be allowed to speak on May 1st. I think in fairness to the applicant, uh, I would ask confirmation that those procedures which you thoughtfully put in place will be respected for the May 8th hearing. Yes, there's, there's nothing that we have, uh, there's nothing that changes from, from well, those procedures. Right. We had encouraged the city, um, we, had, we had offered the city an opportunity to speak today, and that would presumably still be the case. They did submit, as you know, they submitted a document, uh, and we did offer them an opportunity to speak today. The, uh, the, your, the ground rules that you set um, said that no person or group will be permitted to address the commission unless they have submitted a brief. I did not see a brief from the city. They submitted an opposition to the proceeding, not a substantive brief. So if they want to come and speak and talk about their belief that you don't have the authority to do what you intend to do, that's your decision. But in fairness to my client, you put all parties on notice that if you wanted to come forward on May 1st and make a substantive position, you would put it in writing affirmatively on April 17th and then a reply on April 24th. You left open the window that if an entity chose not to make an affirmative presentation on the 17th, they could reply on the 24th. We provided a writing on the 17th. The city chose not to file a written response to our presentation on the 24th, and I think it would be prejudicial if you then allowed the city or any other entity who had not responded in writing to come here on the 8th and bring up arguments that had not been put in writing so that the applicant had an opportunity between the 24th and the 1st to be prepared to address them. Well, uh, we certainly hear your point. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, I think that, well, no East, no East, he had responded to, on both cases. Um, for the record, we'll be deferring everything on that, but I just want to put it on the record. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Then um, at that, this point, we will suspend the rest of that. Um, any further consideration of these issues um, until... Mm -hmm. um, a week from today. And we'll repost. And yeah, we repost and so forth. Um, I guess we should just go on to the rest of our agenda. Um, I think maybe in anticipation of the circumstances, we're going to take a quick break um, and, um, and then reconvene and carry on with the rest of the agenda in uh, five or ten minutes. Minutes. All right. We're going to make it to We're going to make it out of town. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Can move I to the front of the line. <laughs> All right. We are uh, reconvening you, public meeting month number 182 <laughs> at uh, about 11.35. And we are to item number four, approval of the minutes. Commissioner McHugh. Uh, we have, uh, Mr. Chairman, two sets of minutes uh, in the uh, book, and as soon as I uh, find them in my electronic book, I will move for their adoption. 
I had a quick comment on number on the second set of meetings. Maybe we can uh, approve them separately, Commissioner. Yes, I was going to move for them separately and. and uh, The first uh, set is the uh, minutes of March 6, 2014. Uh, they are in the book. I would, uh, in, the, in the meeting book, I'd move their adoption as uh, uh, they're appearing with the customary reservation of um, the power to make uh, uh, typographical and other mechanical corrections. Uh, do we have uh, a second? second? Second. And do we have a discussion, Commissioner? Oh, yeah, on uh, page three, yeah. um, in the italics motion in the middle, it starts out saying... 2.24 p.m.? Uh, 11.57 p.m., sorry. 12.14 p.m., sorry, we're up at the top of the page. 12.14. 12.14, right. right. In the middle it says, and replacing that final sentence with a sentence that reads, this says that the arbitrators may make adjustments. I thought we, does this accurately say what your motion said? Yes, I think so. So we've struck the final sentence and of the, of the handbook of the handbook and replaced it with the sentence that says the arbitrators may make just adjustments. Yes, I thought we removed the right of the arbitrators to make to make adjustments. Well, I'll, I'll be guided by the uh, my, my recollection was that this is what we did, but I'll be guided by the collective memory of the I, yeah, my, my well, my, the, the what would appear to me the key here is um, I don't have to remove answer. to remove the direct conflict. Um, the adjustments were very limited in, and, and narrow. Right. Um, um, still under the you know fundamental well, did, inconsistency. Did, did you, I thought, Commissioner McHugh, that your intention was to remove the flexibility that the arbitrator had to. Uh, make changes because we thought the authority we given them was kind of vague and broad and broad right and replace that with our right to review for the for purpose of fundamental inconsistency yes and and this is uh, 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 this sentence the new sentence is a much narrower uh, grant of authority to the arbitrators Correct. than previously existed and uh, we're not limited by this. I understand that. But yeah. you did mean to give, so there's two parties that get to do a fundamentally inconsistent no, review. No, no, Direct conflict is, is, is different than oh. fundamentally inconsistent. Fundamentally oh, inconsistent right. is broader, i.e., okay. if, if the statute says you may not do something and okay. the award says you may do something, there's a direct conflict. I mean, and the, uh, and the best and final offer says you may do something, that's a direct conflict and the arbitrator can change it. But apart from that, the arbitrator has no power to make uh, corrections and, and, uh, uh, and distinctions. Okay. I didn't re realize that's what you were doing. But if that's, you know what your motion was, so that's fine. Okay. Right. Any other discussion on this set of minutes? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it unanimously. Um, All right. The next set of minutes is uh, on uh, page 274 of the uh, meeting materials. Um, and uh, it is the minutes of April 17, uh, 2014. And I would move that they be adopted in the form presented in the uh, meeting book with, again, the customary reservation of rights for typographical and mechanical errors. Second. Second. Um, discussion? Commissioner? Yes, yeah, I'd like to um, uh, direct the attention to uh, the hour of 10.35 a.m. 10.35. 10.35 a.m., Yeah. page two. Um, 
a little stylistic, but I think uh, would be helpful to um, insert um, halfway through the sentence there, where it reads that uh, Commissioner Zuniga presented and the Commission discussed. Um, I would like to insert the exclusion and inclusion of certain costs in the definition of minimal capital investment. Um, Sounds good. Any, any other discussion? I, I, we, this, wasn't this the meeting where we did the first draft of my memo? There's no mention of that. We, we, the legislative changes memo? No, that was a previous one. That, was that a previous I one? I thought that was a, an earlier meeting. I don't think we did. This is the last, our last meeting. Wasn't and we didn't discuss it at the last meeting, I recollect. You know, um, there was, was, where was this? Uh, yeah, this meeting was here where you presented the memo was at the Heinz Convention Center. Okay. Does anybody, does anybody have the agenda for the 117th meeting? Happen to have it? Uh, no. I don't. All right. Well, if, if, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. So it's hard to believe. You, you summarized this, right? Was this the meeting that we talked about, the legislative changes memo? No? Oh, okay. Never mind. Artem knows. Yeah. Artem knows. Perhaps I can guess it. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. As, Aye. as amended. Uh, I too. Ne negative, no no's. So all in favor, unanimous. I'm losing my head. You're not alone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. So we are going to item number. Are we going to skip ahead and do. Admin Where are we? Wait a second. <clears throat> to administration, right, with uh, Executive Director Dang. We are ready. Okay. Earlier than anticipated. Mm -hmm. No kidding. And so, a good morning, still, uh, Chairman Crosby and Commissioners. Just have a few topics for general administrative update that I'd like to let you know about. Uh, first, on the personnel side, our Human Resources Office and our Horse Racing Division has filled uh, 25 positions. We have four open positions. One of those is our desktop support specialist, and we understand we have a good pool of candidates there, so we're, we're, I know our, our IT crew, as small as they are, uh, not in stature, but in numbers, uh, are very excited about the possibility of getting some additional assistance. Then after a lengthy search, uh, we are also been very fortunate to recruit, uh, pending background, a gaming agent and assistant director with about 30 years of experience, and so we think this is a uh, this staff addition, uh, and we're confident it's going to work out. Will be the timing of that addition will be really great for us to move forward with internal control surveillance, and basically everything that, that pertains to, to on-site regulation. So we're uh, really watching this process as we move forward. Hopefully, we can actually have somebody on board around uh, middle of May. I'd also like to update you. We are uh, beginning tomorrow. Uh, with a review of the financial policies that the Commission had previously authorized with uh, interviews and drafting policies. And then we also anticipate our, we've started on the comparison of the travel policies project as well and uh, last week, so that is now underway. In addition, uh, we, have our expand, we have started our expanded development of our personnel policy, uh, compensation analysis, evalu evaluation system, our HR strategy, uh, and improvements. Uh, this process we anticipate will be about a four month process and that's also all underway. So all three of those policy steps that we had talked about uh, have been moved forward and are now going forward as we have planned. We're also completing initial research concerning a central management system that collects regulatory and financial data of our slots play in the Commonwealth and uh, we've had a team of our staff that have uh, visited I think uh, three three states at this point and actually looked at the systems, talked to um, the regulatory authorities and the private suppliers about those systems and, and uh, we think they're moving forward with the planning process on that issue. Uh, we also uh, uh, have our contractor and our staff team, team are still working with the development of our licensing management system uh, with the current part of the project. Uh, at the same time, uh, we've asked them to start building uh, what will confident we're going to need is the second phase of the project. First one gives it operational so we can uh, basically move forward with a data licensing system. The second one is designed to bring in all the parts that are going to be necessary to support it. 
Uh, and, and of course, uh, we'll have the slot regulations up that, that our staff will be asking approval to start the formal process this, this morning. And if we're fortunate we can stay on track, we'll be looking at uh, surveillance and uh, internal controls in May. We've also made some significant pros uh, progress on development of our high performance uh, plan and project. And, we, and this project will provide us a solid foundation of shared goals, supporting goals, actions, and measurements. And we, we hope to be able to have the Commission hear more about that project as we move on later this month. Uh, at that point, uh, Mr. Chairman, that was my short report. And I think that brings us to uh, your uh, memorandum and the potential changes for 23K, unless the Commission has any questions of me. Um, do we want to do your topic first? Or you, you are right for time? Okay. All right, so that would be item uh, 5D. Um, whatever it was, I guess it was a month ago, we reviewed a, a memorandum that represented um, my thoughts and uh, the thoughts uh, in, compiled in conjunction with the legal staff um, about the variety of legislative issues that have been raised, mostly by our bidders, but also by a few other people. We. Um, talked about a number of them and either agreed or disagreed and agreed that more work needed to be done. I've now rewritten the memo pursuant to what we discussed and, uh, and to that further work. And it is in draft still, but it is addressed to all the leadership, the governor and the leadership of the legislature and the appropriate committees. Um, and I just want, I think I should run through this and make sure that with all of that we're on board, there's some decisions still to be made. Um, I just want to point out that uh, at this stage of the game, our plan is to treat the Category 1 license awards exactly as we treated the Category 2 license award, and that is to make it as if we do pick an awardee, uh, that we will offer the license to them under the terms and conditions of the law as it presently stands. Uh, if someone disagrees or won't accept some of those, um, we have never discussed what we would do. Uh, and so at the moment, we're only talking about uh, awarding the license on the law as it stands. If there, are, if there are issues, we will cross that bridge when we get to it. But we did want to uh, advise the legislature on our opinion about which of these issues needed to be addressed by the legislature, and if they did need to be addressed by the legislature, what our re uh, recommendation would be. Uh, the first issue, we've talked about uh, ad nauseum, which is the implications of the repeal legislation. Uh, there's been concern about a whole host of costs that would be triggered by uh, an award, including the one-time licensing fee, the slot machine fees, the assessment for operating costs, the public health trust fund, and a variety of costs associated with construction schedules and construction, the 10% investment deposit, um, we have given ourselves the flexibility in our regs to deal with these should we decide that we need to. If somebody takes the position, as some have int intimated that they might, that they cannot accept, for example, uh, putting down an $85 million non-refundable deposit with the repeal re still st as an issue, uh, we've given ourselves to, to the tools to deal with that. We don't need legislative help, uh, whether we will do that or not remains to be seen, but we have the tools to deal with it if we need to. There are some other costs, uh, contingent project site payments, uh, certain kinds of construction costs if you get moving on the project, costs associated with the host community and surrounding community agreements. Those are beyond our control. Um, but our recommendation here is that the MGM said that we might be able to give them some guidance on these issues. Uh, our conclusion to the legislature and the governor would be, we have not yet pursued what, if any, guidance we could provide here, but we do not believe that legislative action is required or appropriate in helping to deal with these issues. Is that, we, I think we agreed on that last time. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the next um, is the tax rate. Uh, they want assurances that um, the tax rates won't be changed. Uh, we think that the legislature probably cannot um, bind a future, a future legislation, furthermore, in virtually all other jurisdictions, the tax rate is subject to change by the legislature at any time. Um, and uh, taken together, our, 
our recommendation would be that it's our view that it is unlikely that the present legislature can or would bind a future legislature vis-a-vis -vis guaranteeing the present tax rate. But in any event, the tax rate is not our responsibility. Mr. Chairman, did you skip over number two? Oh, I did. I'm sorry. Thank you. The on-site daycare problem, I think we did talk about this before. Uh, MGM and Wynn, I think, read that to re that we require that the law requires on-site daycare. Uh, we think that is not what the law does. It does say that it, um, uh, let's see, a close reading clear that providing a facility is not a requirement, but rather something that the commission may consider in deciding whether to award a license. And we conclude we believe the commission can address this issue through its regulatory authority and will not require legislative action. Okay, on that one. Right. Uh, tax rates, we talked about license parameters somewhat similar to the tax rate issue. Uh, there is concern that was expressed particularly by MGM um, that um, the Category 2 license holder could theoretically by the legislature be given the right to do, to do table games. Um, and they uh, ask for relief from us, including reducing the, cab the table game rates for uh, possibly for the Category 1. In any event, those are totally beyond our control. Um, the Commission does not have the authority relative to setting the tax rate or reducing the Category 1 table game rates. Uh, we also believe it's unlikely that the legislature can or would bind a future legislature. Accordingly, we do not believe that either Commission or legislative action is called for on this issue at this point, although the Commission will consider establishing a position in favor of no changes to key licensing parameters during the 15-year license period. It isn't up to us, but we could take the position. I think it's worth thinking about whether we would like to pass some kind of a statement saying that we think that's appropriate, but that's well, not on the table at the moment. Why? Why is it not on the table at the moment? Yeah, in terms of a, re uh, bless uh, in terms of a recommendation to the legislature. And I'm sorry, I know we discussed this before. No, it's all right. In terms of a recommendation to the legislature. So you're suggesting why, not, why don't we take that why position right now and make it part it, of it? Yeah, right. I'm, I'm, I would be okay with that. I mean, we, I think we've all kind of indirectly talked about the fact that we, we've said it repeatedly about internet gaming. It's not fair to bring internet gaming, you know, while our licensees are just think they know what the lay of the land right. is. They need to be at the table. And I think we've said it sort of colloquially and informally right. relative to the tax rate and the status of the uh, Category 2 licensee and right. so forth. So right. I would be perfectly happy to change that to say, however, it is our recommendation to the legislature that there not be any material changes in the key parameters. I would, I would encourage that. Okay. You know, the, um, you know, especially as the environment in the Northeast gets a lot more competitive, I think for our operators to have some sense of the lay of the landscape for the next 15 years would be a benefit to them and ultimately a benefit to the Commonwealth. Okay, good. I Can I, um, is the concern or the, the chief concern appears here as written to be uh, live table games. Um, was there anything in uh, what we received uh, relative to electronic table games, Mr. Chairman? I don't think so. Okay. I, think so. I, 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 I wanted to take up that topic when we get to um, Same here. Mr. Glennon. Yeah. Yeah. That picture at the end of his presentation uh, raises, that, uh, mm -hmm. raises that issue. So. Okay. All right, so if I, we have a cons we agree you're comfortable with making yeah, that change. Maybe we can say uh, substantive changes, I mean, because we don't know what the next 15 yeah. years, this industry changes constantly. So I, I would for say us to say no changes at all, I think, for well, 15 I would, years. I would say, I would change to say material changes material. to um, key a, licensing parameters. Right, right. And certainly slots only as opposed to table games is a key licensing parameter. Right. Yeah. Okay, good, I'll make that change. Uh, number five is the CAPEX parameter. Win and MGM interpreted this as requiring 3.5% uh, every year. Um, that is not what the law says. Uh, we can waive that if it's part of an overall CAP plan. And I think we talked about this last time, our recommendation was we believe that the Commission can handle this issue and its regulations, and there is no need for legislative action. I did add the parenthetical, it's not clear to us what the legislature meant by net gaming revenues derived from the establishment. Net gaming revenues is not a defined term. 
uh, and if they wanted to clarify it, fine. If uh, if not, we have we will define it ourselves. Can I? Um, this, sure. This wouldn't change the the recommendation ultimately, but um, there is also a um, a timing element or a timing discussion relative to capital expenditures. There's pragmatically there's no need to do a lot of capital expenditures years two and three. You know, the, the, uh, on on real estate, the, the building is new. Um, a 3.5% capital reserve overall bears a lot more significance in, in, in my view and experience as the asset depreciates, uh, certainly over time. And I know that's implicit here that uh, on a multi-year, there's language relative to multi-year uh, investment, but uh, I, I, if, if nothing else, I think our applicants should be assured that I, I, I for one, do not believe that um, there's any uh, implicit requirement here to start uh, doing a lot of capital expenditures on the front uh, end uh, years of the life of, of, of a real estate asset. Um, now, obviously, there's very different life, um, uh, useful lives and depreciate, de depreciable lives uh, in many of the components of the real estate assets, uh, but just wanted to mention that uh, uh, there's a, there's a, there's really a timing element here that I think is very relevant. Right. Uh, I, I I agree with that. And this is I mean, we've got some time on this one, but this is something we will have to get to on our regs. Is how do we deal with this and what is net gaming revenue and so forth? Um, okay. Number six is the issue of on-site space for mental health treatments and problem gaming. The uh, win read this to think that it was required that they provide comprehensive substance abuse, compulsive gambling, and mental health counseling and treatment services. Uh, we think that's not what it says. The licensee is required to provide, quote, complimentary on-site space, close quote. It doesn't say how much or for what. Um, the services that would go in that space, if any, would be determined by the commission. So our conclusion here is we believe that this issue can be managed within the commission's regulatory authority and does not require legislative action. Gratuities, uh, item number seven, uh, this is a section of the law that requires uh, tips to be pooled by dealers and gives the commission the authority to determine how tips and gratuities should be distributed and that um, no supervisory uh, folks should be in that pool. There were, um, Wynn had proposed that this be changed. Um, the unions recommended that they not be changed. Uh, we broke it down into two issues. First of all, there is a concern about who should actually do the determination of how the pool gets split up. Um, and although it suggests that we have that authority, we conclude with Todd Selp that we, that means we also have the authority to delegate it to the owner, to the licensee, or the licensee and the labor union or whoever if we want to. So if we think that's the proper practice or if, if, if Wynn, for example, persuades us, if they were the licensee that that's the proper practice, we have the authority to do that without any legislative change. There is the issue um, that there apparently are some categories of employees who sort of help in the bits, uh, help with the dealers. They are not supervisors, they're not management, and in some models, uh, they may get a piece of the tips, um, but our, our bottom line after talking to our consultants and to some of the operators and so forth was that this was not a big enough deal. That issue was not a big enough deal to warrant uh, legislative action, particularly given the legislature's willing, uh, you know, unwillingness to do anything other than the most critical matters. So we add addressing this issue would require, this latter issue would require legislative action However, it does not seem to the commission that this is an important enough issue, issue for the legislature to take action. I, I don't understand, Mr. Chairman, what the antecedent for this is. It's, it's the follows secondly is the antecedent. Uh, I think then that the sentence would be clarified if we said uh, that yeah. uh, tips to, uh, the distribution of tips to non-dealers instead of this. Okay, so, good. But the other, the other, uh, uh, so, so that. I got it, yeah. Okay. 
the, but the other issue I thought was uh, that there are some categories of dealers who, by tradition, even in places where tips are pooled, are typically exempt from the pooling requirement. Poker dealers, I think, were one category. Uh, and I thought that was part of, though not all <coughs> of the, uh, the win interests uh, uh, suggestion here. Uh, the, the, their basic position was that they know how this should be done, and they do it very successfully, and that's no doubt true. But that's not what the legislature thought, and that's fine too. But but there are there are these categories of dealers, and I, th I think it's mainly poker dealers who, who keep their own tips for a variety of reasons that that um, have to do with um, that that makes some sense. So I don't know if we want to want to uh, recommend that the legislature allow us to decide what tips should be pulled and not, or delegate that to collective bargaining agreements uh, to take into account that possibility. Yeah. This is this as presently written, it's all dealers for all right. games. And um, the, 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 re the research we did on this, the, the, the labor unions were unanimous right. against making this change. Um, uh, and making the, any change to the pooling requirement. To this statute. Yeah, yeah. right. And um, to this section. And um, the other applicants and outsiders that we talked to, I think it may be that when it does have some kind of relatively unique proposal, plan of dealing with this, um, it seemed to be a win idiosyncratic if you're nodding, Ms. Crum. Uh, oh, okay. Um, but there was no, Win Win has this feeling that was, it, seemed, it was only Win who pushed it. Um, it didn't seem to us that that brought it to the level of recommendation, recommending a legislative change. Yeah, in, ge in general, I don't disagree yeah. with that. But I, I just do wonder about the, uh, Director Day, uh, is, am, am I correct that typically the, where there is a pooling uh, protocol, uh, poker dealers are exempt from that? Um, Commissioner McHugh, as a matter of fact, oftentimes that is the case. Uh, but, it, you know, as, as we were uh, talking about this, it seems like the, 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 the law is clear about the pooling. Right. And then it, then it seems as well to provide the commission, the, at least in my impression, the ability to write regulations to define the, the rest of those individual elements, including the, the concern about the person that might not actually be a supervisor <laughs> or a dealer. Um, and it, it also, uh, as Commissioner Crosby um, stated, I think it also provides the, the commission the ability to delegate or defer the actual development of those specifics. Uh, I think it would be possible for the commission to put in some guidelines or some um, some direction into the regulation because uh, we're doing some of that in some other areas like internal controls will define what the areas are but we won't necessarily list every specific step that the licensee has to take and it seems like to me that this language would provide the commission the same ability to deal a little more particularly with the different cases that there might be and the different like, uh, operators. But the no, the no uh, supervisor, this uh, exclusion of supervisors from that tipping process, I think is a strength to the statute, and I, I would encourage yeah, us to keep it. It's been an that. ongoing uh, issue in, uh, across the board in, in Massachusetts, and, and, and the focus of a lot of litigation over the last 10 years. Um, so this is consistent with the way the, the general the law, this, this exclusion of supervisors is consistent with that, that uh, approach. And my bottom line, because I circle the wagons on occasion, is that, that I, I would concur that it uh, doesn't need legislative change either. Okay. I think actually now that I think about it, it's probably within our authority to say to a particular licensee, if you want to pool everything and then give it back in the way that it was, you know, in other words, unpool it in the way you distribute it, you can do that, which would in effect exclude the, de the poker dealers if, the, if they wanted to, because that's the method of distribution. So you could yeah. require it to be pooled, right. and then you could redistribute it however you want, including in such a fashion that the but, poker dealers got back whatever they. But that would put be in. negotiated. 
right? You're well, saying it would be. We're, I'm just saying we would have the ability to delegate that either to the to the licensee or to the licensee and the unions, however they right. chose to do it. Bottom line is we could deal with it by regulation. The bottom line is we can deal with it. By, I'm not saying how we would deal with it. I'm just saying we can. I yeah. think we can cover pretty much any option in our regs. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. The next issue is reports on complementary services. This uh, is a complicated, and I hope I can do this justice. Um, nobody really understood exactly what this was uh, at first, what this was about. But the, the law requires us to get quarterly reports uh, on all complementary services offered or engaged in by the gaming licensee. Um, and at first, we, the, both Wynn and MGM said this, uh, it doesn't, this is administratively um, clumbers, clazed, clumsy, clumsy, inconsistent with other jurisdictions, and an invasion of privacy. It would be anonymized data. Um, so I don't think the privacy issue is a concern. Um, but a, New Jersey does have virtually the same requirement. Uh, and I've talked with their people and they do have some uses for the data. Um, Michael and Carol, our gaming consultants, thought they couldn't figure out what you would do with the data. Um, in Pennsylvania, there is not a requirement to make an, a report, but they are required to keep an audit trail in order that the commission can, from time to time, audit the complementary services. And the reason Pennsylvania said that they do that is because they want to make sure that there aren't comps being given to somebody's brother or, or you know, some, somebody that shouldn't be getting comps. So that's, but that does not, they require an audit trail, which I imagine is, is there as a matter of course. Um, and Pennsylvania occasionally does audit to see how the comp services were distributed. Um, the New Jersey um, taxes Complementary play. They're concerned about complementary. They don't care about complementary drinks and stuff, although they are recorded. But they are, uh, if you, they count complementary play, slots play, as part of gross gaming revenues. So they get a tax on complementary slots play up to $90 million. Anything above $90 million uh, is not considered part of gross gaming revenue and is not taxed by the state. Um, it's complicated reasoning how that came about. Um, it, they were, it was a statute that was put in to try to equalize the playing field when Pennsylvania came along and didn't tax um, complementary play. Um, so it's a little bit idiosyncratic. They think there may be some law enforcement uses too and they're checking into that and haven't gotten back to me on this. So I don't know, are we, where are we on taxing complementary play? Have we dealt with that issue? Not, not at this point. I'm yeah, not, okay. I'm not so, aware of it, but, it, but I, th I think it is an issue that as we develop the whole net gaming side, that, if, right. that taxing part is something we want to look at. In, in the financial, you know, from a, from a financial standpoint, um, and the way, you know, our consultants read stat, uh, uh, sections that apply to these uh, in the statute, um, we have the flexibility to to let the applicants offer free play, and and which would not be taxed, um, and um, we we also have the flexibility by regulation to limit, if we want it, uh, that free play, uh, which is the way um, uh, of many other jurisdictions deal with that. They could put a a, a cap uh, by by different means. Um, is there any concern that that the complementary uh, the complementary whatevers uh, show up as a deduction of gross gaming revenues? You mean uh, play or uh, uh, any beverage and food? Every, every. That well, would presumably be listed at their cost and would be an ex would be no it wouldn't be a deduction of gross gaming revenues no I wouldn't see why it would be. no well well why wouldn't it be Mr. Chairman, I think that depends on how the commission chooses to write the regulation on the calculation as we move forward. But I, I think there are some practices that, that that would be a deduction before taxes. Right. So I think it's just a, that's why it, as we move forward, it's it, how the commission treats complementary services, complementary play will have an effect. Right. 
complementary plan, maybe complementary other things. Yeah, complementary services, yes. Well. Rooms, meals. There, there's also um, the issue that for card for rewards card customers, we're pretty sure that the that the operators know everything that they get. Um, but for non rewards card customers, um, they may well not have a record of the free drinks that they got um, or other such things. Um, so, in, in, in implementing this um, would be tricky for non reward cards holders. What, um, where, where I come down and I, I'm, is that this seems like to require this as it's written is, if not a big project for them, it is for us. We'll be getting these massive reports every quarter and have minimal use for it. Uh, and I don't think we're far enough along to really know exactly what, you know, to wit, we're not sure how we're going to handle uh, free play. So um, what I, but, but this does have some implications for regulation, appropriate regulation. So this was one where I thought a legislative change would make sense to give us the right. In other words, the commission may require gaming licensees to submit quarterly reports rather than gaming licensees shall. So we would have the time to think this through uh, and figure out where we want to come down. Mm -hmm. And draft regulations that are consistent with the goals we're trying to achieve rather than just get a data dump that right. we have to then filter through. Correct. Right. I think that I, I agree with that. I do as well. I agree. Uh, this doesn't change you know, the, the conclusion, but are, are we uh, comfortable that um, we're talking about free play here as well, because the, the way I always read this section was um, that it was limited to services or items, complementary items. And I, I don't know if um, free play could, 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 could be characterized as fitting within any of those, and that's, I guess that was, that was, that was my point. Because I think there's very different um, things when it comes to free play or everything else that could be offered complementary? Well, the, the, the New Jersey statute clearly, which is, this is, appears to be what this is modeled after, clearly includes free play. Right. You know, that's what it's all about. Right. But I'm, I'm, I'm honing in on the yeah, specific no. letters here where it says uh, services, complementary services, um, and then further, uh, the report may also include any services or <laughs> items. Um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but anyway, um, I also, as, as, a, as a separate or additional uh, point, um, I think it would appear to me that Pennsylvania's approach is, is very logical. Um, you know, an audit trail rather than a, than a report. The ability or the access, you know, which again, we, we may be able to um, um, decide or, 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 um, by regulation. Um, but that's a lot more effective, in my view, than what you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, just getting these reports and right. going somewhere. Well, this would, uh, um, well, so you're saying the, the amendment would say this commission may, requ the commission may require licensees to submit quarterly reports or take such other actions. Maintain uh, records yeah, or, right. you know, yeah. et cetera. Add that. Yeah, I know. As long as, as long as, yeah, as an, as an alternative. Right. So we still have the power to ask for some reports. Right. And on. Doesn't May cover that in order for us no. to. Well, it's have only the says. Ability. It does. It does. Well, no, it's, it, it says we may require them to submit <coughs> quarterly reports. It doesn't say anything about just maintain records so we can. Okay. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Be more specific. Yeah. Um, do we want to raise the issue about um, whether services means free play? Um, I mean, if, if we don't raise it, we get to deter determine it. Yep. And if we... Well, my, my, my point here until, until today, uh, I always assumed that services did not include free play. Right. Um, but what would services include then? Uh, food. Drinks and rooms. Drinks. Uh, rooms, uh, 
because it's also items. Um, you know, in, so in other stats, because this, this goes back to the to the to your question, Commissioner, about gross gaming revenue. Um, free play clearly has an effect on gross gaming revenue. It's it gets you know it gets deducted. Um, other um, complementary items um, are not necessarily um, dire as directly tied with gross gaming revenue. It could be. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, I understand that distinction. Um, I understand your point. I mean, I think you could read this to, to not include free play. Free play. Yeah. Uh, Services. It's a legitimate point. So should we ask for clarification, or should we just define it ourselves? I mean, less is more, I think, here. The, yeah. more, the more nuanced we get, the less likely we are to get a response. Um, yes, and, and if we say the commission may require reports and audit uh, right. and documents, I, I think that right. gives us running room to yeah. figure I mean, we, out what we we're doing. We're doing lots of defining right. what they meant by such and such, right. and right. to, to right. single mm -hmm. this one out, I think right. we're probably right. better to let us decide it ourselves. Right. But it's, in, but it's, I think it's yet to be decided. I think what you're saying is a perfectly reasonable yeah. way. Right. Okay, good. Next one is cashless wagering, and I did, there's a typo, I said costless wagering by accident. Uh, Director Day, I had not seen that. Um, that would be a new one. Yeah, right. <laughs> costless <laughs> wagering. <laughs> not one that and many people would be reaching out right. for. <laughs> right, might be something that the consumers would really flock to. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it took us a long time to figure out, nobody knew exactly what was being talked about here, um, but we, um, and we're still not entirely sure. There is, as our regs are now being drafted, um, and Director Day pointed this out to me, there are, sections which talk about cashless wagering. And it's not clear whether, um, you know, that means going to an ATM and getting some money or whether it means an independent standalone system. I mean, it's just not clear exactly uh, to us. Even I think as we're drafting our regs, we're not 100% sure what we're referring to, right? It's still being evolved. But none of our applicants um, said that they are going to do cashless wagering, and you know, none of our present licensee and the applicants we spoke to all said we're not going to do cashless wagering, so this doesn't matter to us. Um, so our conclusion was that um, we don't see a reason for legislative action on this because it doesn't seem to be impinging on anybody as best we can understand it. And there was no further comment from anybody other than what was originally submitted with, their, with the applications back in January. Um, so that's where, that's where that's, that's our, my recommendation would be uh, that there's, we don't see any reason for legislative action at this stage of the game. There's also the issue of the, the, the monthly reports. Is that this one? Um, yes, uh, there has been, this would require a monthly report to the reward cards holder of their, their gambling record, their wins and losses. Uh, and there was some objection to that, not, uh, not huge. Uh, but the, the law is very clear that at the time of signing up to become a rewards called holder, you may choose not to participate. Uh, and there are any number of other ways to get out of the system if you're in it. Um, so it seemed to me that it's the, the, the reward card managers can really manage that pretty carefully. And people, if people want it, then the law is there, they have it. And I think people can get it now if they ask for it. Mm -hmm. um, but the, man, the managers of the system can make it very clear to people whether they want this or not. So they can control, the licensees can pretty well control that transaction. So we felt that we shouldn't um, try to mix mess with the reports. So bottom line was on this section that we take no stand that there be no recommendation for change. I, I would concur. Um, I, I did want to uh, talk a little bit about, um, in, in, in this section uh, 29, the first part implies uh, an opt-in rather than an opt-out. 
but the fur further, the section, and I don't know if this was part of what um, our applicants have, uh, have, have flagged as, as a concern, um, but further down that section, you could get, uh, you could assume that it's a requirement as opposed to an opt-in. Where in the sentence it says, a gaming licensee who implemented such a program shall only report to the commission the amount of money spent and lost, and the who participated in the cashless wagering system. Yep. That's reports to us. That's not report to the consumer. But this is all hypothetical, right? Nobody plans to do this. If it's a cash, cash, cost, sorry, costless, costless. Cash, cashless, right? right? No, it says, no, it says, the, in the middle it says, the gaming establishment shall issue to each patron who has been issued a rewards card or who participates in a cash, cashless wagering system a monthly statement mailed yes. to the patron's right. home. So That's, they, they conflate, they start out talking yes. about cashless wagering system, then all of a sudden they're talking about That's rewards right. card holders as well. That's right. And, and, and the record, so a record card, rewards card holder may opt out at the point of becoming a rewards card holder or any time thereafter. And if I remember uh, correctly, uh, um, at least one applicant mentioned, could it be the other way around? Could it be an opt-in as opposed to an opt, uh, yeah, an opt-in as opposed to an opt-out? Um, I think it could be, and, and you know, my, my position on this is, as I said, is less is more. I mean, I think that, that these are smart folks. They can, they can manage it. Yep. you know, however they want to. Fine. And um, so I, I would think rather than try to get into too granular. The, too, yeah, too granular, yeah. yeah. Well, that's what regulations are for, I suppose. Yeah, true, good point. Okay on that one? Yes. Um, all right, number 10. Um, this is um, the basically the requirement that, we, that if any payment is made at the moment, the standard would be $600 to a winner. Um, that um, before the payment is made, the, up, the licensee has to hold a check a database and make sure there are no deadbeat dads or unpaid taxes. This is done in a number of other jurisdictions. Um, and, you know, operators aren't crazy about being in that role, but other, others are too, banks are too, in other various respects. So, um, and I think we tend to think that the public policy objective here is an appropriate one. The problem is, um, that Massachusetts does not have the capacity to do a web portal, to do an online check, and won't for some period of time, they say a year or so. Um, let's see, Commissioner, Commissioner, oh, it was you and I, I guess, who talked to them, yeah. Um, and other systems do, they, the, um, their, our present licensee, Penn, has said if we want them to, they will take a thumb drive every week and check it um, but that will always leave the possibility that somebody, that the thumb drive is always up to date, but also that somebody has paid up and we pull back their money and embarrass them in the public, you know, that's not a good thing, obviously. It's not gonna happen very often, but it probably will happen once in a while. Um, so we, we could do this, DOR I think is willing to work with us on this. Um, the question is, do we want to recommend that we do it on this, you know, uh, best, as best we can with some kind of a weekly report, or do we want to recommend to the legislature that we wait until the web portal is available and then implement this reg, this uh, requirement? I would strongly favor the latter. The, the <clears throat> former isn't going to work. It's it's going to lead to mistakes. It's mm -hmm. going to lead to uh, payments to the number one deadbeat dad. It's going to, uh, you know, uh, and and. It simply isn't going to work. Yeah, I would concur. My experience with um, uh, kind of regulating gun purchases before the system is in, in place, where you had the uh, automatic checks and the, the portal was there, it was uh, very problematic. Hmm. Um, so until that system is built, I think it's really um, difficult, if not, nice. it, it, there will be many mistakes. Yeah, our, our financial consultants have flagged this as a, as a real operational concern if, if they had to uh, keep people waiting or, uh, you know, uh, technology these days could be so 
such a great um, aid in this process, and it, it would occur to me that uh, it sounds like DOR may not be far from from that future state. I'm so, sure that have it in place. The high degree of likelihood it'll be in place when the casinos come online. Uh, the question is whether it's online in time for uh, the Category Two. Right? I'm sure. So, I, 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 yeah. so yeah. can I interrupt and just sure. talk to this yeah. for a moment? So, in discussions with uh, the technology people at the Department of Revenue. Um, they're open to uh, maybe even a, a, a quicker track to provide something to be able to allow an online inquiry, um, you know, uh, based on social security number. So uh, to that end, we've had conversations with them. They are going to talk um, hopefully next week to the compliance people at Penn about what Penn is um, doing in other jurisdictions and see what we can do um, about providing um, an inquiry that goes to both um, tax delinquents and people that owe child support. But would this be uh, to some real-time database, or would this be to some database? Which yeah, is it, would, it would. Dior would expose a, a URL which Penn could use to do an inquiry that would just return uh, information. It could be yes, this person owes, and then there need there might need to be follow-up, that kind of a thing. Um, but it would but be a real-time database. It would be. Yeah, it would be. It would be. You know, it would be updated in mean, real time, meaning. Um, they may flush data into it overnight, and you're going to inquire yeah. against it for the most current. Um, you know, it's going to be current. I would say it's not going to be a, a, a refreshed data set. It will be online. It'll be maintained by DOR. But their technical people are talking to the pen people, and I think they're going to look to give us a solution. I can't. I can't say it's going to be in less than a year, but the way they're um, going about it, it, it very well could be. I, I, I mean, I, I agree with your point. I, I'd love to see the technology available where it is real time, and you know, certainly understand we don't want to embarrass somebody in in line in front of their peers or friends or whatever. You know, my my biggest worry is uh, more of an optical concern of before we have a system in place, one of the top ten scofflaws of you know did be dead or a tax scofflaw walks in walks out with his big wager and, you know, we can't even identify the top 10 worst offenders, I think would be a, a huge black eye for, for us and for our licensee. I, I also want to say um, we want to refrain from using, DOR specifically requested we refrain from using the term deadbeat dad for, because their agency is trying to work on it. So I, I'm, I respectfully, it's the third somebody, time. Somebody who owes somebody money. Yes. Okay, general support money. Um, is this uh, one um, one of the other uh, elsewhere, or in an earlier version of a memo you had, um, the six hundred dollar figure appears in multiple instances, and right. this is one another one. Uh, <coughs> that's that still is is the current thinking that uh, the threshold would be uh, equivalent for uh, for all of them. Yeah. Every place the six hundred dollar threshold that should be clear in here. If it isn't, it is. It's clear. You, okay. You have every a, every six hundred dollar threshold would, would, would switch to this federal standard. Yes. Okay. You yeah. explain that at the end. Right. Thank you. But commissioners, the the idea that you were moving forward with is is to go forward with it when there's proper automation to allow that to take place. It wouldn't even would still match what John was saying relative to the current inquiries. Well, if 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 there if there's a chance that there'll be, you know, a decent chance, not a certainty, but a decent chance that they'll be up and running when the Category 2 license start, when Plain Ridge operates. And if Plain Ridge is prepared to do a, a jury rig system for a while, if need be, they don't want to do it particularly, but they're not strenuously opposed to it, then we really don't need to change this because it certainly will be. I mean, there's a, it's, you know, it might happen that in the course of the first six months of Plain Ridge operations that, um, maybe there's a mistake made, but um, it's probably going to be maybe twice, and, and uh, we wouldn't have to try to get another change made. Well, in uh, the pen officials that were in this week um, expressed uh, concern about it and said if they had to, of course they'd do it, but they saw it as problematic, a thumb drive kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know what the harm would be in just asking this will go into effect when the technology is there. So that may or may not be before. 
Yeah, I, I'm, I, I could go either way. I just, I think that it's, it's going to so be. So the sensitivity of the data, the thumb drive idea, is a bad idea. We really don't want data. I we know. don't want to possess the I data. Know. We really want DOR to expose it through a portal, and they will maintain it, and we'll have an inquiry based on social security number. And that's, that's the best way to do it. This is the type of information that you don't want on a thumb drive or even right. being sent around. Well, you so. forget the thumb drive. You right. can still right. do it that they just access a, a database which is updated right. every week, not, and, and not, I, yes. every, not every day. I'm, 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 I could go either way. Um, do, you want, do you guys have a preference? Well, what, what, this, this talks about the, the question posed here is do we want to recommend a jury rig system or propose postponing until a web portal available? And I would be in favor of the latter. So that when right. this, even if it's an interim web portal, or an interim solution that ties into a uh, reasonably current database. When that's available, this would, this would, this requirement would kick in, but not before, because I think any other, mm -hmm. a book, mm -hmm. a thumb drive, any other mm -hmm. kind of system, a is bound to fail and uh, 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 is going to put us in in the possession of a lot of data that we don't want to have. I don't know okay. how, we, I I don't know how I, we express I'm, that in legislative language. Yeah, well, we'll we can do, I'll, I'll, do that. I'll follow up on that. Okay, so we'll, we'll go with the, mm -hmm. this is, I realize the question isn't very well framed, but we'll go with the real time, wait until the real time capacity is there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, An integrity where we don't take ownership of the data. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah. Um, Commissioner Stebbins has twice now recommended that they send over the list of the worst people so we don't end up on the front page of the paper. Um, well, I want, I want to see the technology. I mean, this is going to be a very simplistic hypothetical. I mean, if we were operating a bank and John Dillinger comes in, would we say, ooh, can't report him because he's not on our list? But, <laughs> but how do you distinguish? You owe X amount, you owe Y amount. I know. So I we know. charge you, we don't I charge know. you. I think that's not but, a direction we want it, to go. We balance that against the embarrassment of, you know, we're letting somebody who owes somebody money, I won't make the common reference, and letting that person walk out the door because technology. Yeah. I hate to say it, I'm afraid it would reflect more on DOR than on us. <clears throat> you know, there, mm -hmm. you know we, we, we can't do this until we have a real-time, we can't reasonably do this until we have a real-time database and there isn't a real-time database. It's a good point. And that would give, the, mm -hmm. you know, they were going to try to get it done on time and this is all f further incentive for them to try to get it done by, they're talking June now, so it's, we're talking more than a year. Yeah. Penn, yeah. Penn National's talking June, so yeah. they're talking 13 months from now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this may be academic, but it's still, we still, still it's yeah. a mm -hmm. good idea to. Okay. Uh, number 11, uh, this is reports of winnings. Of, um, this is not the withholding issue, this is simply sending reports uh, to the Department of Transitional Assistance, which is welfare, basically the old welfare, and to the um, unpaid um, child care uh, agency, which is the Department of Revenue. The, the Roman numeral 4D agency is a peculiar way of referring to DOR. Um, so that those two agencies would know who have been big winners. Um, we, we would always try to change this to 1,200. If, you know, we hope that all the thresholds will change to 1,200. Um, and um, beyond that, you know, we think that this is, uh, I think, and, and having talked about it with others, that this is a reasonable requirement. And um, other than changing the threshold, we would not recommend legislative intervention. Go ahead, Doc. Just one other thing. Um, Along the, the threshold line, I think you also need to narrow it to the winnings, whether it's 600 or 1,200, uh, and subject to withholding or reporting under Section 62B, which we are about to get to. Otherwise, you would require the uh, gaming operators to report on winnings that they have no record of otherwise. So in order to harmonize the three sections that involve these tax uh, implications, I think you need to limit uh, the six or twelve hundred dollars, however it is, to only those winnings which are subject to withholding or reporting under Section 62B. Which means slot wins. 
a slot or a table in the exotic uh, right. uh, case. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, exotic beds on table games. Well, there's, you know, under federal law, there's yeah. the 300 to 1 for $5,000. Test, uh, yeah. I don't refer to them as exotic, and but. 60 to be of the. State law. Federal state. Oh, state law. Because the state which law incorporates the federal law, which ends up a saying yes. um, only slots. Yep. Only slots winnings. Mm -hmm. Okay, I didn't realize that's where you were coming down, but that's that's fine. So, um, so you're saying we want to harmonize this with the federal standard, both as to the threshold it. and as to the definition of winnings. Well, yes, but you, I think you really want to harmonize section 51 and 52 with section 62B, section 2, which is the Massachusetts general law. And everything in yeah. section 62B references the federal law. So we're just really harmonizing 51 and 52 with 62B, which is really the engine that drives the whole tax issue in Massachusetts. That's that's basically 10, it's 10, 10 11, up. 13 on this sheet. It's number 13 on yep. the next page. Right. Is that is so everybody, everybody following all that? Lawyer. I know. Yeah. So yeah. you'll help the chairman right. make that correction. Yeah. I right. took tax in law school. That's why. Right. Did you? Uh, well, yeah. Oh, it was I the last too. time. <laughs> Once. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So. Uh, this will, uh, this is incorrect. It's other than we'll change the 600 and we will uh, harmonize the nature of, win of the, which winnings we're talking about. Right. All right. So I'd say which are subject to withholding or reporting under 62B section 2. Yeah. Something, what was it? And withholding subject to? With withholding. Uh, withholding or reporting. Withholding or reporting. Uh, under section, uh, chapter 62B, section two. And that's because um, table game winnings are virtually impossible to track as to the winnings. That's right, although there are some instances which we'll get into uh, on number 13 where right. they are under federal law right. uh, withholdable, right. subject to withholding, I should say. Um, so all we're really saying is that when there's a tax event, then the casino will obviously have a record of it, and those are the events they have to report to DOR and uh, DTA and, and others. Mm -hmm. yep. Right. Okay, got it. Um, number 12 is the assessment concerns the um, concern that MGM, I guess, at least, and Win, I guess, both don't like the operating costs being assessed on them, the open-ended operating cost, don't like the assessment at all, and the particular don't like the open-ended assessment, um, and um, they don't like the open-ended public health trust fund and recommended a variety of changes. Uh, um, I think that uh, we think that having the ability to assess our operating costs uh, on the operators rather than going to the legislature is one of the strengths of the law, and that's why they, the, law, the legislature did it the way they did it. And we have no, we've never expressed any interest, nor do I think we would anticipate, you know, increasing the public health trust fund. That will also be funded by monies from gross gaming revenues. Um, so I think our position would be that we think the system is right. We have agreed already uh, to talk with our licensees to set up some kind of a committee structure with our licensees so that they have an oversight, not an oversight role, but a you know, an informational and advisory role on our expenses. We don't just willy-nilly send them a bill. We're going to set up a group uh, of our licensees who will get to go over our budgets with us and have to have a hand in, in us determining reasonableness. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't think that either we or the legislature would be interested in making these changes. I think that the, uh, there will only be four licensees at, at most, and, and, and having, <coughs> having them participate in some way in o oversight advice mm -hmm. uh, is really important, right. and I think that um, I think that uh, with that um, and the and the power of the the power of public opinion that we're right. afraid of, of our free press going right. after free our lavish right. lavish lifestyles. Right. Yeah. Right. 
Right. No, I mean, it's there. It's a check. Right. And it's an important check. So I think that would suffice. And I do agree that this is an important uh, independence keeping mm -hmm. uh, provision. Right. I, I would agree as well. Um, I would just um, also mention that in, in addition and in parallel to the to the idea of establishing a group, an advisory group, and review uh, um, group. Um, we are already working on, uh, Director Day, uh, um, Derek Lennon, our, our CFO, working on benchmarking and comparing uh, mm -hmm. and testing, uh, you know, re real hard, uh, our costs with um, those of other regulatory agencies in our position in other states. There are usually a lot of, a lot of differences, but that's exactly what we're working on. There's many uh, benchmarks that we will be looking at presenting as, as early as this uh, late June when we present our budget to, to, these, to this body. Um, there's measures around, you know, percent of uh, gross gaming revenues. Um, there's measures relative to total costs per FTE. Um, so th th there is a lot that we have been thinking about. Um, um, that, that uh, is important to underscore here. I don't know that we want to put it all on there um, in a memo to the legislature, but um, if, if nothing else, um, as long as um, somebody understands that we are being very careful and deliberate about this, um, I think it's important. Yeah, we're also working on, on getting to a stage, are we not, where we're posting uh, on a we monthly have. or some periodic basis all of our expenses. And and we, we are we already are. posting. Right. We are already. But, yeah. but in the future, we're going to have a, uh, uh, as the commission moves forward and approves the uh, a budget that's broken down in division, it will be a lot clearer and a lot better detail. Right. Okay. Um, 13, we've talked about at length before because we've already submitted that ref recommendation right. to the legislature, and um, we, we do have to move on this um, because the legislature don't want them to fix the $600 issue until they can fix all the $600 issues, so it's one of the reasons why we need to hustle right. this memo up to them. So we've dealt with this. Mm -hmm. um, I did forget to mention, and, and I do put it in the cover memo, that uh, Mohegan Sun, I mentioned him, Wynn and, and uh, MGM, because they were the ones who submitted most of these concerns. Uh, MGM did submit a letter, but basically has, I'm sorry, uh, Mohegan Sun has said that they are supportive of the legislation uh, as it stands and didn't raise any of the issues here. They're, they proposed working with is simplifying a couple of them, but they didn't. Uh, they didn't object to, to any of the uh, uh, conditions as or st sections as they stand. Uh, number fourteen, parity of the tax rate. This is again another issue that really is not. It's not within our control. Uh, Win and MGM are concerned if it's a tribal casino, they might come in at a lower tax rate, possibly seventeen percent, possibly zero, uh, and that that would be um, problematic for the other license holders. Uh, we clearly agree with that. We understand that it's a problem. Um, but at this, certainly, the controlling the tax rate has got nothing to do with us. We can't change the tax rate, and we can't, um, uh, so we can't address this issue. But in any event, I think that we are all sort of stuck with being able to do nothing more than, than <coughs> wait judiciously and transparently for the two processes, the commercial process and the tribal process, to work their way out. And we, I try to make it clear that we fully well understand that there are real, real serious conflicts of interest here, um, but it's not anything that we could recommend to the legislature that they try to address at this point. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. this is another one that, that really would benefit from applying, uh, creating a policy based on a, on a known set of facts rather than on hypothetical. <laughs> Right. There'll, be, there'll be time enough to try and fix things if they're terribly yeah. broken as the result of anything that happens down the road. Right. Right. Chapter 15 is credit. Uh, it says, no person other than a gaming licensee shall issue credit to a patron in a gaming establishment. Uh, MGM read this to possibly preclude the availability of ATMs. Uh, as Todd and I talked about it, 
we don't think that each time you use a credit card or a debit card that you're being issued credit. You're, issued, you're being issued credit when you get your credit card or your debit card so that we would not interpret this to preclude a being, ATMs being in the, in the uh, facility uh, and therefore don't think it, there's need for any legislative action. Well, certainly when you use a debit card, you're not being issued credit uh, on each withdrawal. But why aren't you, why aren't you being issued? If I, if I go charge something on a credit card, it's money that I don't have. Credit card company is paying a, a, a debt that I've incurred, and then coming and collecting a debt from me each month. But you have an approved limit. They've looked at your finances right. and, and right. have taken the risk that you have the ability to pay up to X amount, and that's your limit. Yeah. You also the, so the, I have a, the I grand have a line of credit, and against the, that line of credit. I'm incurring, uh, I'm incurring debts. If, but, I, if my line of credit is a thousand dollars and I don't use it, I have no debt. You don't have debt, but you do have credit. I have credit, mm -hmm. and I don't. But when I have, when I go out to dinner and pay three hundred dollars for twenty people, <laughs> uh, <laughs> not in Boston. Then, then I have. Then I have a debt of three hundred dollars. Um, here's we we could we could go on and on with this, but but I just wonder how this this approach to what an extension of uh, credit uh, how, how this approach to extension of credit ties into the gaming framework that we're developing. Um, I, I think it's I think it's different. I don't think it does. Well, I, if we if we take the position that there is no if you if you get the one thousand dollar line of credit or the ten thousand dollar line of credit, and each each uh, debt that you incur on that line is not a separate extension of credit, w would that be consistent with? Uh, with the gaming framework that Mark's trying to develop ultimately? Or do we have to make it consistent with that? I well, mean, there's, there's some we can, I guess, maybe we, can we kick the can down the road on this? We yeah. can interpret credit however we think it needs to be interpreted. If we think for some reason or other that it should be interpreted to mean use of a debit card or a credit card, then that's our judgment, and we can use it. If we want to interpret it to not mean that, we can not mean that. Okay, but then, but then that would require a revision of the last sentence in the second paragraph, because that... Which paragraph are you talking about? The second paragraph, paragraph of, of my number memo. 15. The, sec the second sentence of, the of your memo, because that, that, imp that says we've made a determination as to, as to what... Oh, I see what you're saying. Right. I, I would be perfectly happy to say that we don't need, we can handle this by regulation and we don't need any legislation. I, I would be perfectly happy to say that, but I would, I, I'm troubled by saying that we've decided that the establishment of the line of credit is, uh, uh, is all that counts. Is it fair to read that uh, these these may have been intended towards actual people? Because it says no person, actual people, uh, trying to preclude individuals from yeah, operating in a gaming establishment. They repeatedly use person to mean individuals. Entities as, as well? As entities, yeah. The general like definition that. section of the general laws right. okay. says person as an entity. I think so does this statute. The, yeah. Well, I, mean, to, I, I, I think it's pretty clear, in my view, I know it's not in yours, and just because it is in mine doesn't make it so, but I do agree, and we talk, Todd and I talked about this at some length, that the, the credit issuance happens at the time you get your credit limit. You are then using the credit that you have been issued from time to time when you do transactions. Um, whether that's inconsistent is something that Mark is trying to work on, I don't know, we can double check on that, but it's, if, if, it, if it isn't, um, then I think we should 
we should, I think it's okay to put this definition there. I do think this is what I think this is what issuing credit means. I don't think every time you use your credit card, you're issuing oh, credit. I, I agree with that. But uh, you know, on, under that, under the view that you take, Commissioner, um, would somebody paying their restaurant bill in the gaming establishment um, Obama can do that. would also would also constitute issuance of credit? Uh, paying your restaurant bill with pay. a credit card. Yes, that would be an issuance of, of, of credit. <coughs> so you couldn't effectively pay with credit card on, on, under the definition that, that, that it's, so this would not only apply to um, ATMs um, and credit advances, it would also apply to restaurant transactions, conceivably. Well, we, we could write it differently. If, if we were trying to implement what Commissioner McHugh is saying, that's, which, that's my I point. We don't. We could. We I could don't say see it that way. Either. We could I, say I, I ca for cash, you know, but it, it would be hard. Yeah. What if you just want to go use the ATM and get cash? You're not getting ATM to get cash to go to the slot machine. You're just going to get cash because you need some cash. So, um, commissioners, and if I could just be of, of help, it, it's actually a. Uh, um, I hate to say it's either way, but but it is practically speaking. Um, my direct experience with it has been the use of a card. You couldn't use a card at, at the gaming table or at a machine, a credit card or a debit card, either one. But on the other hand, you could go to the cage and get cash directly uh, to go out and gamble with. That's kind of, that's, but that's an application of regulation, which is what right. Commissioner McHugh is actually speaking to, is the commission, the commission, I think, here can actually deal with uh, what its intent is via regulation or how it wants to interpret that because uh, on the other hand the responsible gaming framework and and those concerns are, do revolve somewhat or as well around the issue of use of credit card so it's it's something that that uh, uh, is treated in, at least in my experience in different ways in different jurisdictions but the question is whether submitting this sentence to the legislature puts us in a position of having said something which is inconsistent with what Mark is trying to accomplish in the framework and that we might agree to try to accomplish. I, I, I thought it was, I thought it was uh, what Commissioner McHugh was saying was, was uh, um, since the commission does not interpret the section to preclude such transactions, was basically saying uh, not encouraged not to reach that conclusion and uh, just the last part, which is no legislative action is required, we can do it by regulations. I, I, I thought that was uh, where Commissioner McHugh was that, going. That, that's what my it is. That's okay. what my recommendation would be. The commission could handle this issue by regulation. No legislative action is required. If we want to define by, uh, by legislation, by regulation, what what the first part of that sentence says, we've right. got the power to do it. Well, usually, yeah, in, 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 in I think all of these, we explain at least briefly what our thought process is. We don't just say no legislation act required. You know, we, we say why. Um, and this would be idiosyncratic. And I, it seems to me that we ought to just check the mark and make sure that we're not saying something that is going to get in his way. And if he is, we'll have to think of a different way to say it. And if it isn't, we do it the way it's said here. So is it okay to say it to, as, as long as it doesn't compromise work that Mark is doing that we might agree with to go forward like this? Yep. Is that all right with you? Yes, Mr. that's Thank fine. Uh, from my perspective, that that uh, and just an answer to that question is is that it does uh, says does not interpret the section to preclude such transactions, uh, I, and I'm making no conclusion whether the commission. Uh, wishes to authorize use of credit cards or not authorize use of credit cards in the gaming, but that part may, may restrict that conclusion as to how the commission wants to come down on use of credit cards in an establishment. So I'm not, I'm not saying what you're talking about is unusual. Actually, my experience is what you're talking about. I'm just saying that, that it is handled in, in different ways um, if the commission wants to leave itself that flexibility. What about if we just took out the parenthetical? I realize that I'm being obstreperous, but uh, I, I am concerned about the role of credit cards in the casinos. And 
I would not like, and we haven't really fleshed out all of the, th the thoughts, to say nothing of the regulations, dealing with how we're going to use, permit the use of credit cards in casinos. And I'd hate to do something here that puts us on record as defining, uh, 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 defining something that may later, later bind us in other contexts. And if we said, since the Commission does not interpret the section but include such a transaction, no legislative action is required, and the Commission can handle the issue through promulgation. That works for me. I mean, I, I would go on. I, 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 I wouldn't want to be in a position of interpreting this to mean something I don't believe it means. No, in I order understand. To get, you know, this, so is, this is goes into the into the kicking the can down the yeah, road okay. kind of thing. All right. Without. So that we so that we at least see what the can looks like. Okay. So fifteen without the parenthetical. Right. Okay. Okay. Can, can I mention something sure. to fourteen? Yep. Um, this this doesn't change um, necessarily the conclusion, but um, an alternative to parity on tax rate is parity on minimum capital investment, um, which, you know, the, the tribal process does not set forward. I don't know that the legislature would take any action on that, but may go uh, a little bit further to explain that um, there's, uh, there, there's another um, factor in the formula here, and that's the minimum capital investment. It's not just the difference between tax rates but the fact that the tribe does not have a minimum capital investment. So what are you, so are, what are, you, are you suggesting that we do something here? Well, uh, perhaps explain the context. Uh, it, it, this, this presumes um, that other things are equal and it's only the tax rate that's different. But there, it, it, you know. Well, neither, yeah. Other things are not all equal. But nobody's raised that. What we're doing is dealing with issues that have been raised by people. Right. And nobody's raised the issue of the, uh, the capital, you know, the differing cap X. Right. Well, I, mean, it, I, think, I think they're related. Um, you know, I think. Well, um, if, you, if you want to give me a sentence or two, I'd be happy to okay. add it in there to I'll, um, enhance that paragraph. Okay. I'll. Um, I'll think about it and okay. give it to you. Is that does that work? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I didn't mean write the second. I meant later on. Um, Enrique had sentence. Okay, uh, sixteen is the much discussed Corey modifications. Um, we do agree with groups who have expressed concern to us that are the regs with the automatic disqualifiers um, are too rigid to accomplish other important public policy objectives. Um, so we have uh, Commissioner Stebbins and um, Director Griffin have, rec with the help I'm sure of the lawyers, have recommended, and Todd I think, have recommended um, that we modify 16B as shown here. And um, that, in th the gist of that does bring uh, uh, bring the statute in compliance with the modifications we've been talking about. Whether it's the right way to do it and the language is exactly right, you know, I'm not sure. That's what I was just throwing open for everybody. Do we are we accomplishing as well as we can what we are trying to accomplish with this particular language? I I think the the language that Todd has helped us draft is is consistent. I guess one minor issue is you know whether we're we need to strengthen the language by saying that that person has completed their sentence, whether that's a necessary addition. Well, wouldn't it be hard to um, prove rehabilitation without completing your sentence? Good point. What we're saying here is that we're talking about the, the, the service, the gaming service employee, right? But we say it in a way that talks about every other other, other, every other category rather than that. That's true, although I, I would just add that it also covers, and I wanted to raise this, the, uh, vendors. Right. This would also allow the commission discretion to uh, consider rehabilitation for any vendor or vendor qualifier. 
Okay. So it, it is a little more expansive than mm -hmm. just the gaming service employees. Okay. But I think it still leaves us the flexibility to look at rehabilitation as well as the other criteria in which we can disqualify a licensee or a registrar. Right. Uh, I agree with this uh, approach. I think it's a, uh, I think it's a good approach. I, I wonder though if the last part of the sentence uh, which uh, begins uh, on the line reading, the commission shall consider. Uh, it ends with whether such conviction should not be an automatic disqualification under this section. I wonder if it wouldn't be better to say and whether such conviction should be a disqualification under this section. And I say that for two reasons should not be means that presumptively uh, the, the disqualification remains in place unless the applicant shows that it should not be a disqualification. And secondly, it focuses, it, you, by use of the word automatic disqualification, it simply answers the per se question. It doesn't answer, it doesn't appear to give the commission, the, dis the discretionary power it needs. Uh, and it seems to me that if you just say whether such conviction should be a disqualification under this section, it allows uh, the commission to exercise its discretion to the fullest extent of what all of the people who talk to us are asking for. I've been wrestling with the presumption issue, and I haven't been able to articulate it very well, but that does go towards, what, rather than somebody in this circumstance having to prove that they're not a bad guy, um, could we presume that they're not a bad guy, but we can determine that they are be from their, from their record? Right. And you're taking a, at least a half step in that direction, so I sort of, I sort of like that better. It still puts the burden uh, if you're an applicant other than these other applicants, there's still a burden on you to demonstrate your, rehab your rehabilitation. Um, but, the, but taking out the negative does sort of make it sound like you know, you're not trying to rebut a presumption. Does, does that flag it though? Does that flag the, the application? To, I'm just not sure if if the, the individual, well, you're saying the individual still has to demonstrate rehabilitation. Right. right. Mm -hmm. but, but you're not, you're not going to presume that the automatic disqualification remains in place unless and until they show both rehabilitation and why, given the rehabilitation, the automatic disqualification ought to be displaced. You've got to prove rehabilitation and then Commission considers whether uh, whether uh, this should be a disqualification. A it should be a disqualification. I'm not sure in the practical reality whether it's really any different, but I think it's. I I, I think I think it is, I, and I agree with Commissioner McHugh. Um, I, I I I think I can imagine a scenario where a lot of case is. Um, uh, is, is, is done through the many interpretations, uh, and, and um, so I, I would agree with his uh, with his edit. Yes. Oh. Okay. I do, I do too. Sense. I mean, I, I I'm not sure how significant it is, but I'm, I'm either way, I'm a, I'm in favor of it. You're all right with that, Todd? Sure. I'm yeah. sorry. Could you just repeat? okay? Pardon? Could you just repeat the recommended language? The beginning with whether this the sentence would read whether such conviction should be a disqualification should the same scratch okay. oh I didn't realize you were taking out automatic too yeah, yeah I see yeah okay okay that's it um, thank you uh, I guess we need a vote that with the amendments as discussed um, whether then I can be directed to submit this to the appropriate parties. Can I? 
And, and this clearly goes in the stylistic. Um, but I would mention that um, perhaps reordering um, the number here to put at the forefront the, the, the topics that we do recommend yeah, that's action good idea. That's good and, idea. and leave yeah, at the end right. all of the ones that we don't. Yeah, let's crystallize something that's been in the back of my mind. Thank right. you. That's exactly this, this right. Is yeah, a, the heading. Right. Heading, yes, yes yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Thank you. That's very helpful. Right. Good. These are important readers, and mm -hmm. their, their time right. is valuable, and we hit them with the important right. thing at the beginning. Yep, yeah, absolutely right. I'll do that. Any other thoughts? Somebody, do you want to make a motion? Yeah, I will move that. Uh, then um, the commission authorized uh, Chairman Crosby to present the recommendations as outlined in the memorandum in the packet of the commission uh, with the edits um, um, resulting from this discussion and uh, period. I did, I did mention submitting to the legislature. Second. Any further discussion? Uh, I'd just like to say that I want to thank the chair. A lot of work went into this. Yep. Very, yeah, very right helpful document. Um, easy to read, to understand. Yep, um, lots of work, and I just wanted to thank I'm you. Delighted to take all the credit, but unfortunately, I didn't do all well, the work. Well, you but led thank you. the project. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And to to add to that, I mean, a lot of, a lot, you know, it, it shows that we're being responsive and hearing the opinions not only of our applicants but also from other interested stakeholder groups. It's just not discussion that we're taking up on one person's behalf, but a number of other interested parties. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. <coughs> all right. We are to 5D. That was 5C, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. Commissioner McHugh. Uh, 5D uh, deals with, um, well, let me back up. The, 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 uh, everybody's familiar with the fact that we have five sections to the application, uh, the RFA 2 application. And uh, one of those sections uh, deals with building and site design. Uh, we have a very, very able and thoughtful building and site design advisory group that's advising me. That's the section for which I'm responsible. And we have uh, been meeting regularly and um, uh, intensively since the RFA 2 applications uh, were filed. It is clear, however, um, that in uh, the context of uh, the architecture and layout of uh, the buildings and structures and other uh, features that the applicants have proposed, uh, that there is a great uh, deal of uh, room for uh, expression of views, uh, and there are a number of standards that architects uh, use to evaluate uh, uh, buildings uh, and structures and the layout and the framework within which they exist. Some of those uh, criteria uh, were laid out in the white paper uh, we received from the American Institute, local American Institute of Architects chapter early on in our progress. Others are laid out in textbooks. Uh, others are laid out in essays uh, by um, designers of casinos and other uh, 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 structures and facilities. Uh, but it's clear that the application of those principles to uh, various uh, designs is um, a matter that involves some judgment, some perspective, some expertise, some familiarity with, with uh, uh, good characteristics, uh, characteristics that can be improved, characteristics that are not terribly helpful. And so uh, I uh, thought and, and discussed uh, uh, with um, uh, uh, <coughs> some members of the group, uh, the desirability of seeking uh, public comment on the designs that have been presented uh, to us uh, thus far. We used to have a um, rich uh, architectural uh, criticism function in our daily newspapers. We no longer have that. Uh, we had some really good architectural critics. Uh, whose judgments are not binding, but would be, would, uh, nobody's judgments are binding. Our, our judgment is the, in the end the, the one that's binding. Uh, but I thought that it would be helpful uh, simply to seek 
um, public input on uh, the architectural uh, design uh, that has been proposed for these various uh, facilities. Uh, and and uh, uh, thought uh, we could do that through a posting and a request for public comment. That would be public, everybody would see it. Um, and see if we got any thoughtful insights from people uh, about the proposals. Uh, the uh, the uh, layout, uh, the sections, the elevations um, uh, are now part of the public component of the uh, applications. They're available to everybody. Uh, the, uh, so that's all available on our website? Available on the website. And so there's a basis for um, there's a basis for um, uh, judgments made by uh, by people in the community, architectural people who are interested in, in what's being presented, thoughts that may inform us, and all of this would be part of the public record. So there'd be nothing uh, nothing uh, that would uh, detract from the transparency of our process. So I thought that uh, I'd present to you uh, today uh, the thought that we ought to invite comment uh, on those designs, the draft language that more specifically describes what we're looking for, and I'd like to have the building and site design group help with that, uh, with that draft. Uh, but uh, the idea would be to draft this and uh, uh, seek public comment, public input uh, on uh, those designs. Um, we have a wealth in this community of uh, thoughtful uh, people who are uh, accomplished in this area. And um, it seems to me we ought to take advantage of that and, and use, um, or not use, what we hear from these thoughtful people as one lens through which to look at what we're being asked to, to evaluate and decide. So uh, that's the proposal, and I, I put it forward to all of you. I, I think it makes sense. We receive so much public comment, but usually on things like impact and not the design excellence. All of the impacts uh, we, we are, are usually the, um, uh, the comments we receive. Um, so I, I think this is a very good idea because it would be something really important to the entire, all the communities and what, what the building looks like and what people think of it. So um, I think it's a good idea. I, I agree with that. I think it's an interesting uh, aspect of our review and consideration in the public process that we're going through. It clear somewhere in the, in the statute, the language about you know, making sure that uh, uh, the facility fits within the context of the environment. I'm certainly not a probably a good judge of that, but uh, I think what was interesting is we went through the, the host community hearing in Springfield, the number of people that stepped up and didn't necessarily talk about the comments we usually hear about related to traffic and mm -hmm. impacts around the neighborhood, but they were truly interested in uh, how the facility was going to be uh, integrated with historic buildings, potentially historic buildings that uh, that were part of the footprint. And it was an interesting, positive discussion to have as, you know, coming from folks that are going to be living near or adjacent to, to, a, to a facility. So uh, I, I think it's a good exercise for us to go through. I don't know, do you have an idea of how long you want to keep a, a comment period open for? No, I would, I would think we, we, uh, we've got lots of time well, not lots of time, but we've got time before we <coughs> make this, the, the final decisions and presentation, but I would think six weeks, about four to six weeks. And well, for, for Region A, that would be no for problem. Region for, regions, for Region B, I mean, we, don't, we don't have a competitive situation there, right. but we do, no, we, you know. We, yeah, that's right. I, I was thinking more of Region A, right. but you're right. For Region B, we, it would have to be shorter and, and be uh, three weeks or so. Uh, we can adjust that, uh, yeah, three weeks or so. Um, and um, time enough to get into your team's pipeline, basically. Right, right, yeah. right. And this is not a straw poll. This is a did you think of this kind of mm -hmm. uh, kind of uh, commentary. Uh, and 
So, yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think it's a great idea too. I, I've always been surprised that we haven't gotten comment uh, on the on the designs, yay or nay. Um, so I, I think it'd be really interesting, and it's mm -hmm. uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's it's a more subjective. It's not. It is not, as you make clear, it is not totally a subjective matter, what is good design and what isn't. Right. But there is a degree of subjectivity and taste involved in right. it. And I think right. these are going to be significant phenomena, phys physical structures in our community. The one on Everett will be visible to the world, and the one in, in Revere has dramatic design elements associated with it. Um, so I think having some kind of public comment you know, is really would be quite interesting. So I, I agree. I don't think we need a vote on that, right? Yeah, right. Okay, good. Um, are we planning to? I was just going to go through. I'm this? just going to raise this question. So it's now 1:15. Um, we have six and seven yet to do. Um, how long are we talking for six and seven? And should we take a lunch break? Or one? Well, yes. Um, six will be short. And, and I, th I think the uh, slot regulation depends on how much uh, discussion the commission might an anticipate. So, this this uh, slot discussion is uh, to put these out for the formal comment process, right? right? We're not deciding on that now. This is we looked at them before. We made comments to you, John. Yeah, you know? but we we will be raising the the policy issues which we haven't discussed in any detail for for your consideration today. Before we, right. I, I think those that discussion needs to. Before we begin the formal, right. you know, any, any commission needs to decide on needs to be weighed in on today, so that, that we will be having that discussion. Do you have an idea how long this? You know, I think there may be a couple of things that there'll be some dialogue on, but okay. uh, I think we've been through most of the substantive issues, and I don't think there's going to be anything that's going to take a real long time, frankly. Uh, and, and item six, it's uh, amendments that uh, need to move through the uh, formal process as well. I'm happy to do. I'm happy to do whatever. It sounds like we could get through this, and, right. and we could hold off on a lunch break, but maybe we could take a five-minute break. Well, we're definitely going to do that. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Does answer. that work for you guys? That's mm -hmm. fine. All right. So we will take a brief break, and then we'll try to get done before late lunch. Okay.